Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so I work at the Union of Concerned Scientists. We uh, do analysis and advocacy for a more equitable, safer, and healthier planet. We've been around since 1969. And uh, the part of it that I'm in is the Center for Science and Democracy. So we do a lot of thinking about uh, access to science and ensuring that science appropriately informs decision making without interference from uh, ideology, co corporate actors, financial forces, uh, et cetera. And uh, in, in this uh, context, I wanted to talk about some of our work uh, that we've done with communities. I have some uh, reports that I'll talk about and touch on in my presentation as well. Uh, and so I, I, a lot of what we do is uh, connecting science to decision makers, to communities, uh, and back again, and so trying to ensure that uh, science is a tool that everyone can access and uh, can help to ensure that we have uh, policies that protect people, uh, that protect our health, and uh, ensure that everyone can live better. So uh, this is sort of our, our this what I'm presenting today is uh, a working thesis. So I wanted to say that first that I'm I'm very interested in input from you all and thoughts about uh, these issues. We're uh, working. This is an ongoing. A project that we're looking at to think about community impacts of Trump administration actions. So I'm very interested to hear from you all on this uh, in particular as well. Uh, so what we've been doing since uh, the administration took office is tracking the his attacks on science. And what we are considering attacks on science are any time that they interfere with a process where science should have been either informing policy, should have been communicated to the public, uh, and they interfere with that. Uh, and so we've documented uh, up to 96 right now of, uh, of those attacks, uh, getting close to 100. And, um, and so these, this is something we've been doing across administrations. So we also track these under Obama and under uh, uh, the second Bush administration as well. Uh, and so we're seeing uh, a lot under the Trump administration, and uh, and these are, are problematic. And we look at the impacts of these on on people, of course. Um, but I think uh, for this presentation, I wanted to highlight that uh, these these uh, issues are not happening in a vacuum. They are not happening on top of uh, situations where everyone is otherwise uh, unaffected or, or doing well in terms of environmental. Um, conditions. And so uh, there's, it's happening on top of places where communities are already dealing with other issues, other environmental hazards, other problems that our federal government should be addressing, but instead uh, is sidelining the science that should be helping them. They're uh, taking actions that, that don't serve people as the missions of agencies should be. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, so there are several ways that the administration is doing this uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is just that they are just literally increasing exposure to environmental hazards. And we've seen several cases of this happening that I'll go into. Uh, another area is that they're undermining programs that are designed to address inequities. Uh, so programs that existed in the federal government and have for a while to address different kinds of inequities uh, that they're undermining those programs directly. And finally, they're also suppressing scientific information that documents inequities or data that we might have collected to show whether there are uh, inequities happening. And we've seen some uh, suppression of that, some delay of reports that show uh, findings that, are, that highlight inequities or otherwise sort of uh, show in politically inconvenient scientific findings. Uh, and I'll go into that as well. Uh, so I um, wanted to touch on uh, previous work that we've done. This is the report we have up front. Uh, we did uh, this report a few years ago with uh, Coming Clean and uh, Environmental Justice Health Alliance and Delaware Concerned Residents for Environmental Justice and Community Empowerment and Housing Connections. Uh, and this looked at cumulative uh, exposures in Newcastle County around the Wilmington, Delaware area. Uh, and what we found in, th in this is that there were uh, inequities in what communities were exposed to and several of the communities around Wilmington that are more uh, low income and more communities of color uh, did face higher burdens of these environmental hazards uh, than comparatively affluent whiter communities in that area. And here we looked at respiratory hazards, we looked at cancer risks, 
Uh, we looked at proximity of Superfund sites and risk management plan facilities, so facilities that hire uh, uh, with, with chemicals that are explosive on site, and, uh, and, and did find that. And so these are, these, and this is a condition that many communities across the country are facing and have uh, similar conditions. And so this is, this is the background on which all of the Trump administration actions are happening. And so uh, the federal government, of course, should be reducing uh, these inequities and addressing a lot of these issues. Uh, but we're definitely many things we're doing that uh, do not serve that. Uh, and so on the first one, increasing exposure to environmental hazards. Uh, this is uh, a map of potential increases in emissions of uh, air toxics that could result from a rule that the Trump administration changed that allows major industrial sources to potentially uh, recategorize to area sources, which is a lower regulation level, so with less restrictions on, on what they can emit. Uh, and so we did this analysis to look at exactly how how that would play out. You know, what are the potential places that would see more emissions? Uh, there were a couple things that stood out from that. Uh, one is that at least 21 states could see more hazardous air pollution, uh, hazardous air pollution or air toxics, uh, under the EPA's new guidance. Uh, in Louisiana, for example, in Cancer Alley, there's 42 facilities in that one area that could see emissions increases. Uh, and so this is something that it looks like a small change in policy. It was just a reinterpretation of, of a guidance, uh, but we could see a lot more hazardous air pollution emissions just based on this one change. Uh, and then I want to spend some time talking about the particulate matter uh, air pollution standard. So uh, particulate matter is harmful to our health. Uh, it's responsible for, uh, it's, the, it's the air pollutant responsible for most morbidity and mortality in this country, along with ozone. So uh, there's still many places that have unsafe levels of particulate matter. It gets deep into our lungs and causes uh, respiratory and cardiovascular issues, as well as uh, early deaths of people dying prematurely because of it. Uh, and so this is uh, a big deal, and the EPA was ready to re-up the standard, to look at the science again, and decide if they wanted to strengthen that rule. And we're seeing the administration make changes that limit the amount of science that goes into that process, limit the amount of public input that goes into that process. Uh, this graph is the changes to the science advice that the agency is seeing on this rule. So before, we had a panel of 28 people. Uh, they were all scientific experts on this, and they would input uh, their expertise to say, this is the particular matter standard that we think would be protective of public health uh, with an adequate margin of safety. This is what the Clean Air Act requires. Uh, and they particularly look at sensitive subgroups and whether or not it is protective of those. Uh, but we're seeing this administration, uh, in fact, cut many of those people. They replaced a lot of the independent scientists that were providing that advice uh, with people that were either not scientifically qualified to be there or had uh, concerning conflicts of interest, so connected to regular regulatory industries. Uh, and so uh, I uh, co-authored this paper in Science Magazine that talked about this issue and the impacts of abandoning science in this context. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight this part about sensitive subgroups. And so uh, under the Clean Air Act, the policies have to protect uh, sensitive subgroups. So in terms of air quality, uh, this can mean a lot of different things. It means uh, children, it means the elderly, it means those with lung diseases, uh, and it means some racial groups that have proven to bear a larger burden <coughs> of the health impacts from air pollution. Uh, and so uh, the way that they're proposing to change this rule is by uh, placing a higher burden of proof on what the science has to be for you to make a policy or set a standard at a certain level. Uh, and this is really problematic because when we're talking about trying to protect certain populations, uh, we need to be able to use the science and say, this is what we think would be protective of, of public health. And if we have this very high burden of proof on scientists to be able to show that uh, these groups are harmed, uh, that's not providing an adequate margin of safety. So, you know, for example, we're not going to create scientific experiments where we expose children to unsafe levels of air pollution, um, and yet this is what uh, the new chair of this committee is proposing. And so this is really problematic. 
uh, and it, it doesn't it doesn't comply with what the EPA uh, has historically done and what's legally required. Uh, this is from the EPA's own uh, document and uh, that that summarizes the state of the science on particulate matter. Uh, and so under their latest science, they said there is ad adequate evidence that race and ethnicity modify the particulate matter standard, uh, and that uh, non-whites, particularly blacks, are at increased risk for particulate matter-related health effects, uh, in part due to very exposure. exposure. So uh, this is a big deal, and it would have a big impact on people if we were to begin this standard. Uh, and so, uh, and this is also a recent paper I just wanted to highlight that uh, shows that the effects of race and poverty are independent. So even if we were, with air pollution, uh, able to tackle the poverty uh, discrepancy in, in what uh, people, uh, low-income people, are exposed to on air pollution, that there would still be uh, racial disparities in who's exposed. Uh, and this was true if you just look at uh, this is uh, at different levels from the city center uh, who had how much exposure to air pollution you get. So you see, even when you go out to suburban areas, even when you get up to rural areas, you see a difference in uh, who is exposed to air pollution. And uh, there's disproportionate impacts on uh, African-American populations, even out in suburban and rural areas as well. Uh, and this is a study I want to highlight that we did at the Union of Concerned Scientists where we looked at disparities in partic particulate pollution, uh, especially focusing specifically on traffic. And this was looking at California cities and who's exposed to air pollution coming from motor vehicles out there. Uh, and so uh, we see, uh, even when we focus down in, in these areas, that we still see uh, disparities, and our analysis found that African American and Latino Californians have 19% and 15% higher exposure to particulate matter uh, compared to the state average, while white Californians are exposed to 17% lower concentrations. Uh, so these federal policies matter even when you get down to uh, local context, uh, we still see these disparities. And so this means that it's even more important that we make sure that we have as strong a federal standard as possible as the science supports, uh, because even if we're meeting the standard, we still see that play out when we get down to the local scale. Uh, and so on this particular this particular standard, I think it's going to, well, we'll see how it plays out. It's unclear right now what the EPA is going to do about it, uh, but we're watching it closely and, and trying to make sure that we get a science-based standard out of it. So another category that the, the Trump administration is doing when it comes to this work is undermining programs that serve uh, communities. So. One example of this, to, to bring it in a totally different space, is uh, what they've done to uh, Title 10 funds, so uh, funds for family planning for low-income uh, women are, um, are, are is, it's a federal program, and so uh, clinics that uh, serve these women will get reimbursed from the federal government, uh, but the Trump administration just uh, said that you will not get those funds if you even uh, talk about abortion, so not even for not even uh, performing them. Uh, there's there has previously been a ban on, on actually using the funds for abortions, but now you aren't even allowed to mention it or to uh, refer women to a place where they could get one. Uh, and so this uh, is going to have a lot of um, impact on places because a lot Title X clinics are often uh, the only places that women can get health care in some areas. Uh, and if you take away this restriction, many of those clinics. Uh, well, doctors will, will uh, it, it puts them in an ethical bind because they're then not allowed to uh, provide um, appropriate care and give accurate information to patients. Uh, so the way that this is going to play out is that we're going to have a lot less access to uh, care and uh, especially the Title X services for women in many areas. And then uh, another example of this is uh, the National Weather Service has uh, a radio service that they put out to give uh, everyone warnings about uh, severe weather coming. And under the Trump administration, the National Weather Service has limited, they cut off their uh, radio service in Alaska. And so this is going to have a disproportionate impact on native communities and rural communities there who uh, rely on radio to learn about severe weather warnings because there there is not a lot of other uh, access to media. 
Uh, and then uh, the last category of, of things I wanted to mention was uh, the actions that suppress scientific information that tracks inequities. Uh, this is uh, things where the federal government collects data that tells us about inequities or monitors how, how that's going, how enforcement is going. And so one example of this, this is uh, an explosion that happened at a chemical facility in Crosby, Texas following uh, Hurricane Harvey. And so during the floods, many facilities had, uh, chemical facilities had leaks and spills. And uh, one of the bigger one that got media coverage was this, this one at the Sarcuma facility in Crosby, Texas, uh, where there was a series of explosions over a few days. Uh, there was emissions that uh, exposed emergency responders and communities that live in the area. Uh, and so in the aftermath of this, uh, NASA was going to climb, they were going to bring a airplane over, fly it over the area around Houston to get a sense of the air quality emissions and get a sense of uh, what was unhealthy. And uh, the state of Texas and the EPA said, no, thank you, we don't want you to do that. So they, they said, no, NASA was all ready to go. They had a plane all ready to fly over. This is something they frequently do during these kinds of situations, uh, but the, the government declined it. And so uh, that left communities without that vital information to know what they were breathing, whether it was harmful. Uh, and we had very limited information at that time to know what people were exposed to. Uh, and so that's one place where um, the federal government said, you know, we'd rather not know what's, what's in the air. Uh, and this is especially problematic because uh, these are communities that are already disproportionately exposed to air pollution from being in proximity to these petrochemical facilities around Houston. Uh, this is a report we did with uh, Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services, TECAS, uh, to look at the disproportionate impacts that they face. Uh, their communities are right, right there between the, the highway, the port of Houston, and many uh, of the largest petrochemical facilities in the world. Uh, and uh, this was uh, just another example where there was a Nas the National Academy of Sciences was going to do a study of mountaintop removal and the health impacts on communities near uh, these sites, uh, particularly in Appalachia. And uh, the Department of the Interior said, no, thank you, we'd like you to stop doing this study. And they just shut it down entirely. So now it's, it's uh, not happening. Uh, at all, uh, and this would have provided a lot of very useful information about what communities are exposed to uh, and how that can be addressed. Uh, and so ultimately the consequences, uh, as I've uh, hopefully demonstrated to you, there's, uh, they're taking actions that will worsen inequities and environmental risk exposure. Uh, another area that we're very concerned with is the loss of existing expertise uh, to be able to track inequities and to be able to uh, address them. So a lot of uh, agencies, scientists within agencies are, are leaving, uh, they're not replacing that capacity, so we're seeing a lot of big gaps in agencies' ability to even meet their own missions to protect public health. Uh, so long term, where we're, this is going to be a problem. Uh, we've also seen a general shift of trying to get things to the states. So uh, particularly at the EPA, they're doing um, uh, Administrator Pruitt and now Wheeler uh, have an interest in shifting everything to states, uh, which it does not work if we're talking about states that do not have resources to do the same level of monitoring, of enforcement, of, uh, of, of doing the services that the EPA is supposed to be providing. Uh, and so uh, where do we go from here? Uh, we're going to continue to document what's happening and what the potential impacts are going to be. We're currently developing a set of solutions uh, to look at how to address this, particularly when we do get a science supporting administration. Uh, what do we need them to do? What should they be prioritizing? Uh, so I would love your input on that as well. Uh, and uh, we're ongoingly looking to expand access to scientific information, uh, working with community groups, making sure that we can put science to use for good. Uh, and where you can also find the clips, which is my pitch to David, who I might cover this time. Any uh, questions on that specific? Uh, yeah. Does the Union of Concerned Scientists have a official position on global warming? It is a problem. It is us. We need to address it. We need equitable solutions that are aligned with science. 
Uh, we have a whole program on climate change that I can refer to. And uh, there's many of my colleagues from that program here at this conference. So really cool. Any questions? Um, I'll ask. I, you know, a lot of what you talked about that's in rulemaking or, you know, including sensitive subgroup groups in, uh, in the rulemaking process. Um, I'm in a, you know, school of public health, but you were meant to like not ask about social determinants of health. And that's, you know, terminology in the, in the health world that covers a lot of what you talked about, you know, undue burden, um, you know, unequal exposures, the, the idea that there's this existing levels of inequity and then you're pouring environmental, you know, pollution on top of it. You know, have you seen any efforts to incorporate, you know, sort of in the environmental regulatory realm, efforts to incorporate so the, a social determinants of health framework, you know, sort of in a more systematized way, um, since it's a, a well understood and accepted framework in the health world, um, you know, systematize incorporation of social determinants of health in any environmental regulatory processes. Yeah. That should be the case, shouldn't it? <laughs> that seems like something. That's a that was, that's a great idea for how we can ensure science is informing our policies. Um, I don't I, I don't know that it is in that at least in that way. But one thing that uh, somewhat indirectly gets at that that I, I'm thinking about is uh, so a lot of environmental regulations you have to be able to show that the benefits outweigh the costs when you do it, and a lot of for a lot of environmental rules and rules in general that uh, tighten uh, regulations is that you have to, the, the thing that makes the costs uh, outweigh the, or the thing that makes the benefits outweigh the costs is the relationship between particulate matter and early death. So if you can avoid death from particulate pollution, that saves you a lot of money, it saves you a lot of lives. And so that's a, the way that we get a lot of environmental regulations, even on something unrelated, so on mercury or the clean power plan, for example. And so, so I, it's it's an imperfect tool, and, and we can talk about the mer merits of the fact that we do regulations that way and whether that's a good or bad idea. But but one thing it does do is that it gets it gets it allows you to account for all these other co-benefits like that, like all those other things that uh, benefit people, even if it's not just the one thing that you're you're intending to regulate. Uh, and now the administration is trying to dismantle that because it's very inconvenient if you're someone that wants to roll back uh, regulations. So they've been trying to to tweak those numbers. That's why they're trying to mess up the particular matter of process. And so, um, but I I think we should do more social determinants of health. Incorporating into policy. Yeah. Um, is there like any stage where it's like the initiative like on the state level to implement like environmental regulations because of that? Yeah, there's definitely uh, there's state ones that exist. California as often is the driver on a lot of uh, state level air work. Um, the so different states have different policies, which is one reason that map looked really different by. Um, uh, this one, yeah. So this is, uh, it looks different by state because states have different regulations. So some states have put in protectors against this kind of thing because there's, they have a state regulation that says major sources have to meet this standard and they have to use uh, certain control technologies. So definitely states can do more. And I know, uh, so I'm on a board um, for the Council of Governments for the DC region and they, are thinking about it too and say, okay, if they are gonna, uh, and, and a lot, because a lot of what cities, what they're driven by is that the, those federal regulations, at least in terms of ambient pollution, so the regulations of a particular matter in ozone, so the big um, widespread pollutants. And so they've been thinking about, okay, in the event that those get weakened or at least aren't strengthened, you know, what else can we do? What can we do at the local level? And so we actually just completed an analysis that was looking at. Uh, what what can what else can the DC region do? You know, are there sort of local initiatives we can take on? Uh, that that uh, what what's sort of the biggest bang for buck? How do we address some of these equity issues locally? Uh, and so um, so yes, states do do more, and they should be doing even more in light of what's happening. And I saw one last question over here, um, and then we're gonna transition the next just so we have enough time, and then we can uh, ask questions about both uh, implications. What can someone that works for a federal agency do to combat the rollback? 
Uh, first, I would say stay, stay there. And do, uh, if if you're in a, I don't know what people's work environments are like. So you know, if it's a situation where you feel you're you're mentally and physically able to stay, it is. Um, we need good people to stay in the government and do this work. And even though it is uh, challenging right now for many people, I think uh, that's one thing that I'm really worried about is that long term capacity challenge is if we lose all these really good people that were doing good work from the inside, uh, it, that's going to take a really long time for us to build back up that ability. Um, the uh, <laughs> Taking it up a notch, we work with federal scientists, uh, we accept you know, leaked documents and anything else people want to uh, <laughs> hand us. On, um, we have anonymous pathways to, to get that. So, uh, so, I mean, if there is something people want to blow the whistle on, there are lots of options for doing that <laughs> as well. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot. Um, there's a lot, and I'm thankful for all the people in agencies that continue to do this work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Into our next presentation, David Barron is managing attorney of the Washington, D.C. Office of Earth Justice, a nonprofit environmental law firm that represents community health and conservation groups. He has more than 40 years of experience in public interest environmental litigation. At Earth Justice, he and his colleagues conduct legal advocacy to safeguard communities against air pollution, water pollution, and toxic waste. Presentation mode. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can only see up there, yeah, about the, the, the great expert bonus points. Answering your question about what public employees can do, there's an organization called Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. It's a nonprofit organization that uh, public employees can join, and they might have a lot of things for you all now. Make a difference. Uh, so, uh, as Rebecca indicated, I'm managing attorney for Washington DC Office of Earth Justice, which is a nonprofit environmental law firm. I represent a group nationally and locally in litigation and advocacy protect the environment and during this administration we've been particularly busy. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the national actions that the federal government and particularly EPA has taken that impacts uh, all of us but particularly people in uh, communities of color. And I want to start with power plants. Um, power plants are, power plants, particularly coal-fired power plants, are one of the biggest sources of air pollution in the country. They emit uh, not just uh, nitrogen oxide, but sulfur dioxide, uh, and, uh, and particulate matter. In the previous talk, but uh, also a slew of toxics. Uh, and these include uh, mercury, lead, cadmium, hydrochloric acid, and other toxins. And mercury in particular uh, is a well-known uh, nerve and behavioral uh, toxin that can be particularly damaging to young people and infants. Uh, and in, in communities of color are particularly impacted because they're often near facilities, these, these power plants that emit high levels of these toxins. And they're all over the country. The red dots are, are all coal-fired power plants. And in fact, this map does not show every single one. You couldn't get all of them on this map. This is some of the larger ones. Uh, and you can see a lot of them are concentrated in the, the urban urban centers and populated areas in the Midwest and the East. Many of these are legacy power plants. They've been around for sometimes 50 years or more. 
and have little or no in the way of pollution control. After more than 20 years of litigation, the Obama, uh, by groups like ours and our colleagues, uh, the Obama administration finally adopted limits on mercury and air toxic emissions from these power plants. And uh, those uh, rules are projected to save, uh, prevent up to 11,000 premature deaths, thousands of emergency room visits, and hundreds of thousands of asthma attacks, uh, heart attacks too. Uh, the power companies, for the most part, have gone along after fighting these rules all the way, have finally gone along, and most of them, probably about 80% of them, have put in pollution controls. And these have had dramatic, have caused dramatic reductions in the toxics that I mentioned. And what has the EPA done? Andy Wheeler has come in and started an effort to dismantle these protections. And what's interesting about this is that Andy Wheeler, who is now the EPA administrator, used to work just not even a year ago for Murray Energy, which is one of the biggest coal companies in the nation. And Murray Energy is one of the few coal companies, one of the few uh, industries out there that is pushing to dismantle these protections. So what Andy Wheeler is doing is he's trying to do this through the back door. He's saying, well, I'm not going to repeal the rule, but I'm going to redo the cost analysis. And basically what they're doing is cooking the books to ignore those 11,000 prevented deaths from this rule. And they're, they're doing it with, uh, you know, ledger domain and so on by basically, well, those aren't directly because of reducing mercury, they're re because of reducing particulates. And so we can't count those. Even though this rule reduces, unequivocally produces those benefits. And it's not just, <clears throat> it's not just the uh, power plants that are a problem in communities of color. Uh, refineries like these emit uh, all kinds of toxins, like benzene, which is a known human carcinogen. And these are often located right next to communities of color and low-income communities. And this one you can see, uh, this is right next to a, a largely Hispanic community in the Houston area. And there are kids playing right next to this facility, <laughs> which emits hydrogen cyanide uh, gas and which right now is not controlled for that pollution. And then we have climate change. And there's not, not really any dispute left, any, any significant dispute left in the science, scientific community, as Gretchen mentioned, that climate change is due to us, due to human activity. Uh, much of it from those kind of power plants that I mentioned before but also other sources like motor vehicle emissions, methane, and natural gas operations. And there's also not a whole lot of dispute that climate change is causing more of these kinds of events. Severe hurricanes, wildfires, <clears throat> flooding, and so we're seeing this kind of thing happening. And again, oftentimes, the people who are most affected are people in these of color and low-income communities, and the people who get the least help when these things happen. Puerto Rico, uh, where uh, people are still suffering from a hurricane that was already quite a while ago and not getting much relief. And so what is the Trump administration's response to these problems? Another example, uh, increased wildfires, which were really severe this year and in, in the last year in California. And the Trump administration's response to this, withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords, so that not only we're doing less, very little, 
to attack climate change. He's encouraging other, other countries to do less. <coughs> and we have Red Scott Pruitt also trying, uh, trying to dismantle President Obama's clean power plan, which would have cut carbon dioxide emissions from US power plants by a significant amount within the next decade. Yeah. We still haven't totally accomplished this. It's in litigation. But um, their, their rationale for this is virtually non-existent. Essentially is they want to save money for power companies. But this program was set up to be very flexible, to allow companies to trade and, and come up with the most efficient way of reducing these emissions. And that still wasn't good enough for these guys. And this is really not about science or technology or cost. This is about ideology. These guys don't want the federal government involved in, in, in any kind of regulation of business. So that's why uh, they're doing this, even though the Clean Power Plan would have produced all these health benefits, which they don't really dispute. And that's just, those are just benefits directly to the nearby communities. These aren't, I mean, talking about the planetary wide benefits of, of attacking global climate change. And so, another big source of climate change pollution and human pollution, as Gretchen indicated, is motor vehicle traffic. This is a picture of Los Angeles, and you can see the smog, the smoggy skies, and the particulate laden skies in the background there. Under the Obama administration, tougher standards were adopted for motor vehicle pollution that would have not only reduced climate uh, change pollution, but the kinds of pollution that cause severe adverse health effects in communities. And as Gretchen indicated, a lot of times the communities that are most impacted <coughs> by vehicle emissions are low-income communities, communities of color uh, that are located along these freeways. Well, the Trump administration uh, and, and uh, Trump administration has recently indicated that they're going to propose to dismantle these car standards, and not just uh, not just for the parts of the country that you know, don't have strong standards. But they're going to prohibit states from adopting more protective standards than the federal government. And again, this is not necessarily driven by the auto companies. The auto companies wanted some adjustments in the standards, but they weren't calling for a complete dismantling of these standards. Um, and I think, again, this is triggered a lot by ideology rather than any kind of rationality. Another example is methane. Methane is a climate forcing pollution pollutant that is uh, something like 80 times more potent as a climate forcer than carbon dioxide. The Obama administration adopted national standards to limit uh, methane leaks from gas operations uh, that just waste gas and threaten public health and cause climate change. Uh, the Obama administration has, dis has dismantled those protections. But we're in court fighting that, but that's, that's the reality. The problem is not just climate change, it's also down on the ground of protecting uh, farm workers and communities in the farm uh, field. Um, during the Obama administration, uh, there was a proposal out which was well along to ban the pesticide chlorpyrifos. Now, chlorpyrifos is a, uh, is, a, is a pesticide that's applied to a variety of food crops uh, that we eat every day. And it is a known uh, nerve agent. In fact, it was developed by the Nazis during World War II as a chemical agent. It is highly toxic, particularly to young people. <coughs> Acute poisoning can cause convulsions and in some cases even death. 
uh, prenatal exposure can cause all kinds of uh, problems for uh, newborns. And uh, farm workers are often exposed and sometimes hospitalized because this is such a deadly pollutant. The Obama administration proposed to ban it. The Trump people uh, came in and they have uh, rescinded the proposal. And we're in court now to fight that. Uh, but these, these are the are kinds of workers who are most at risk here. And, you, and oftentimes, waste in a position to protect themselves from this kind of pollution. Now, one other air pollutant that Gretchen talked about a little bit more, and we're going to talk about a little bit more, is ozone. And this is what ozone formation looks like in the eastern United States on a hot summer day. We get a lot of power plant emissions from the Midwest. And when, when they start, when things start heating up over the day, uh, ozone starts to form. Basically, I'm simplifying your direction, probably going to get mad at me for simplifying this, but it, it sort of cooks and it forms in the air. And the orange and red are unhealthy to breathe particularly for sensitive people, which that, and that includes kids, senior citizens, people with uh, heart and lung ailments. Now, as, uh, as Gretchen pointed out, the EPA is trying to cook the science here to avoid strengthening our ozone protections under, under Trump. Uh, they're also, uh, they've also been dragging their feet in trying to implement more protective standards that the uh, Obama administration adopted. And uh, uh, we had to sue them twice. First time we got them to designate areas that were violating the standards, which would then trigger stronger pollution controls. And uh, the second time, uh, we just sued them because they weren't uh, triggering more protective measures in, in areas that had failed to meet deadlines for cleaning up their air. Uh, and uh, the, the motivation there is that this pollutant is a very widespread pollutant, and it requires cleanup not just by power plants, but other kinds of industries like refineries. And all of those industries have friends at the EPA and in the White House. These are, these are some of the consequences of elevated ozone pollutants. Uh, people and children who are uh, exposed often have to use medication more often if they have asthma or other kinds of respiratory ailments. Uh, finally, I'd like to say a few words about the chemical uh, Disaster rule. This is, I think, the same picture you showed, so Gretchen, of the Arkema uh, disaster. Uh, in the Obama administration, uh, after many years of effort, uh, stronger protections were adopted on these to, to, to prevent these kinds of incidents. Over 12,000 facilities are covered by the Obama rule. Uh, 177 million people are in danger of exposure. Again, those who are most, uh, most at risk are people in uh, communities of color who are right next to these kinds of facilities or nearby. Uh, and we have an average of over 200 incidents a year. Uh, and with extreme weather, we you know, like the floods I showed you before, we have an even greater need to prepare for these disasters. Other examples of these kinds of uh, events include uh, the 2005 fire at the Texas City, Texas <coughs> refinery, this huge fire at the refinery in Richmond, California, 
uh, the Husky refinery fire in Superior, Wisconsin. And we have here a neighborhood, this is in Manchester, uh, Texas, uh, right near a refinery. Uh, it's in just in the last few months has been exposed to multiple of these kinds of events. From refineries either that close or not much further away. Um, and as I said, the harm from these events fall disproportionately on uh, fence line communities. The model rules were not that onerous. They just required prevention plans, preparedness plans, information sharing with first responders. That was too much for the Trump administration. They came in and tried to stop implementation of this rule. All these calamities happening. We went into court and got that delay overturned. But now they're still trying to effectively revoke most of these protections. And that process is ongoing. I think the comment period just ended in April. And uh, that fight is going on. And will continue uh, until whatever they do is either, they either give up on the effort or more likely it's overturned in court. Uh, just a, a couple of final thoughts on what's going on in this administration and why are we seeing this. First of all, the president himself doesn't care about environmental protection. The only, the only thing he cares about with respect to the environment is dismantling protections as we've seen today. And these are just a few examples. I, this is just scratching the surface. <clears throat> I haven't talked about their effort to repeal clean water protections for thousands of streams throughout the country, including in this region. I haven't talked about their uh, efforts to uh, disregard of cultural resources and wildlife that are sacred to Native Americans by allowing new pipeline development and uh, removing species protections from uh, wildlife. I haven't talked about uh, an agreement they, that we had under the Obama administration to provide better notice to communities about when and how air quality would be monitored in their neighborhoods. Obama and the Trump administration withdrawing from that agreement so we don't get the kind of notice we need in communities when they're going to shut down a clean air monitor uh, that is vital to our knowing in our communities what's going on. Um, and um, and they've, they've tried and so far thankfully have not succeeded too much in uh, in cutting EPA funding and funding for research. Uh, and I, I think they're going to keep trying. Hopefully now that Congress has changed, they won't succeed. They've also appointed people uh, to these agencies, and particularly the EPA, who, uh, who don't agree with the laws they're supposed to be implementing and want to try to dismantle them and who are, in many cases, from the very industries they're supposed to be regulated. This is what we have to deal with now. At, at Earth Justice, what we're doing is suing them. <laughs> and we've sued them over 130 times since Trump took office. And we've won many of those lawsuits, but there are many to come. And we can't win just on litigation alone. We all have to play a role in speaking up and having our voices heard when our when our communities are threatened as they are now. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer your questions. Thank you both for a presentation. I just want to point out that the location where Scott Pruitt uh, made his announcement about rolling back the clean power plant, I don't know if anybody noticed in the top left corner, has 
Hazard, Kentucky. Yeah, of all the places, but I guess Paradise, California. <laughs> so, a uh, little editorial comment. Um, so I just wanted to ask, to, to kick off our conversation, um, you know, thank you to Earth Justice and your work and, you know, in suing the administration, but you gave us a lot of, like, sort of bad news. What what gives you hope? What gives you hope uh, in sort of the, in the, the environment that we're facing right now? One of the things that gives me hope is that uh, they have tried, failed, to, to get changes in our fundamental environmental laws through Congress. And they, they controlled both houses of Congress there for two years, and they weren't able to do that. And the reason they weren't able to do that is because people don't want that to happen. Uh, people did not vote to make America more polluted again. <laughs> and so that gives me hope. And what also gives me hope is that we've been able to use those laws to stop a lot of this bad stuff. We were able to stop stop them from putting the kibash on the chemical safety rules. We were able to stop them from overturning a ban on coal leasing, on new coal leasing on federal lands. We were able to force them to move for implementing the ozone standard that was adopted in the Obama administration and uh, many others. Uh, so those things give me hope. And what also gives me hope is I just see in the people I talk to and what I see in the opinion surveys around the country that people don't agree with these policies. And th th this is not the mainstream. And I don't think they can last as long as we are, as long as we're vocal. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that there's supposed to be this uh, general policy that for every rule that you bring about, you're supposed to get rid of two of them. Is that what you've been talking about uh, when you talk about dismantling certain rules? Is, is that Trump's philosophy that you're getting rid of some of these? What they believe to be unnecessary rules. Yeah, well they, they he issued an executive order requiring that, providing for that that for every new rule that was adopted, you had to get rid of two others. And um, uh, the good news is, I have not seen the agencies possible. It is it is a blatantly illegal approach to government. We have statutes that tell the EPA and the other agencies what, what the ground rules are for adopting and revoking rules. And it is, it is manifestly arbitrary to say, OK, if we're going to adopt stronger chemical safety protections, we have to get rid of protections for babies and for, uh, for, for mothers and for senior citizens. It's absurd. Uh, we've also challenged that executive order in court. It's still pending. But I, I think maybe what you're getting at is it does show what's motivating this here. These guys don't like regulations at all. I mean, it's, it's got nothing to do with science or rationality or compassion. It's got to do with ideology. That's what's going on. with the Center for Biological Diversity. And um, I heard one of your comments in yours, and actually I think it was in your presentation to me, um, this idea of transparency and just this like blatant, you know, scared of it. And I've been doing um, focus groups with individuals about corporate, you know, responsibility and things like that. And, and there's just this um, inherent distrust due to lack of transparency. I didn't know if you could speak to that or if there's like, you know, things, campaigns going on specifically targeted to transparency. Like transparency and. It could be anything. Like on the corporate side of things, it's like, what's in your product? What are you really, you know, that kind of thing? Or, you know, they just didn't even want the Obama era rules that were just asking for more transparency, right? And reporting back. There's like, I don't know, that just feels like a low-hanging fruit to me, and you know, is there a way to make change in that regard? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
yeah, so I think that is part of it, right? They want to, and that's part of a lot of the reasons for the attacks on science, right? Because if you if you just can get rid of or suppress the, the science that's inconvenient, then you can go about your business as usual or whatever you want to do. So I think that is um, one of the platforms, right? It's to sort of just get rid of any evidence of anything that they might have to deal with that would require regulation potentially. Um, and uh, so I, there is a lot of solutions on that front. I think, I mean, we do some work sort of pushing companies themselves to be more transparent. And a lot of these, um, and on the community work too, sometimes I'll, I'll work with the community groups to go talk to the company directly and say, like, this is the kind of information that you should be disposing to the people living in your fence line because um, this is the information you need. So there's some stuff you can do around like pushing corporations in that direction. And then uh, on the federal side, I'd say there's also a lot of efforts to increase transparency in different ways. So uh, one that I really like that has some momentum now is uh, HR1. So the, uh, it's a bill that's passed the House and been introduced in the Senate. And it, it just it, it expands. So it's a lot about voting rights and our ability to um, uh, have a stronger democracy. But uh, one element of it is more disclosure around political spending and who, what communities are spending and how that's being disclosed. Uh, there's also been a proposed law on companies having to disclose more about their climate related risks that Senator Warren introduced uh, previously. So I, I think there's a lot of momentum, and that's definitely like one of the, it should be a lower hanging fruit because it's, it's literally just about providing information. So, um, you know, I really hope that. Uh, one thing, I, I, I don't know whether this is part of what you were getting at, uh, is uh, there's been uh, an extraordinarily extraordinary level of secrecy within government in this administration. You know, the, the sort of the personification of that was Scott Pruitt's uh, cone of silence or whatever it is he put in his office. You know, <laughs> <That's> and, <yeah. laughs> he spent, I don't know how much money putting that in there. But, but they have, you know, when he was in there, he was telling people not to put anything in writing. And one of the reasons, I mean, it's backfired on them, because one of the reasons so many of their efforts have been overturned is because they, they did not have supporting documentation. It was just stuff they made up. And so it's, 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 you know, and so Amy Wheeler is back away from that somewhat. But there's still a lot, of sec lot more secrecy in the secret industry. And, um, I think the ways, one of the ways to get at that is to encourage our representatives in Congress to do more oversight hearings and demand to get the information and find out who people, who they're talking to when they come up with these proposals. I think that'll be a big help. And so, so a, a to do or, you know, kind of an action would be to, to ask your representative to do with that, I guess. Yeah. To, 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 it might be, and, and I think it would be helpful to be specific right, right, right. on a particular issue. They've been doing some of that already on uh, Bill Wareham, who is the uh, head of the EPA Air Clean Air Office, uh, and who came there from an industry law firm representing power company. And it turned out he had been talking to them about the same rules that he was overturning. Uh, so right before he came to EPA, and maybe even after, and so they've been doing some oversight on that. I think we can invite you to go and take a seat at the table and get into some more QA. I saw a question over here. Was there a question? Was there yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's more of a more line, but for just speak to you, you guys talk about um, ideology and how you know that, you know, a big part of what gives um, democratic solutions are. And, um, how can we make this not, like, how can we make it less about ideology and more about the protection for those who want to pull up to New York and have that, especially, you know, for them to show that picture of like, those students in Houston and how it's a little big, or Texas was a big oil state, and a lot of people say that they rely on their jobs to keep them in the country. I do not have to think about that every time, you know, there's like an ideological shift in the administration that's all the law 
I mean, first thing I'd say it's not, this isn't just a Republican Democrat thing. Right? Right. So there's, we have a long history of following science based rules that protect public health under both Democratic and Republican administrations. And at least up until now, we've, we've largely had administrations that respect the process, right? So there's, uh, different administrations have different value systems. They're sort of trying for different things, but they're they're mostly following the steps. And and there have been, and, and so you're never going to get rid of the, the forces that sort of challenge that. So so you know financial interests or ideological interests. And we saw challenges under Obama, even problems with them implementing what we consider them not following the science. And uh, but it's I think now it's sort of different because they're not even respecting the process, right? They're not even worried about whether or not there's so, for example, under the Bush administration, there's a lot of um, manipulating the science to get the answer you want. So they would just like edit the document and then be like, oh, look, this, this species doesn't need protection. You know, right? and, uh, but this administration, we're seeing them, I mean, they're not even worried about that. They don't even care what the scientists said about it. They're just going to issue the rule and see what happens in the in court. Right? So, so there's like a little sort of different approach. But so, I mean, in some ways, this is sort of blowing up what, what uh, how you would normally approach some of these things, and I think it's made uh, it, it's made the courts very valuable in being able to to challenge a lot of the things that they're doing. But uh, I, so I think one thing we can do is just always bring it back to people and who this harms and why this is bad, and that this is just about um, this is just about us being able to have air that we can breathe, and not about whether or not you support President Obama. Right. So I, I think we just need to always bring it back to that and make that clear. Because a lot of these things aren't uh, partisan. When you poll people, people like clean air and clean water and food that doesn't have uh, salmonella in it. Um, and so these things aren't, even when they when they poll people, it is not, it doesn't go by partisan line. So I think if you just can bring it back to that, that's helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I know one of the things with Houston is that they don't actually have any zoning laws, so that's made things even worse. <laughs> uh, I, uh, a good friend that's on the folks at Tejas there, so, so we've done, done some conferences down there. Right? Uh, so that's one thing. But I also saw recently that um, most, uh, well, 42% of all the coal plants in the world are actually operating at a loss. On top of, and I think it's the majority of them in the in the U.S. are operating at a loss. So I think uh, there's got to be this like intersection of not only the environmentalist but the economic justice aspect of it uh, to like raise up uh, the possibilities. Because I mean now solar and wind tech are far cheaper than even any sort of main, maintenance of coal or new coal. So like if we can have that argument. And, and, and put funding into the alternatives. I think people will be more inclined to like not have that, oh my God, the jobs are going away type of argument. Um, but, but I think that's a, always been the problem with being an activist and that you don't have that kind of capital to, to like really challenge it immediately. You have to use your voice and then otherwise to try to push back as much as you can. So, yeah. That's a really good point. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot more of in recent years is participating in state commission <coughs> proceedings where these coal companies, the these power companies, essentially are trying to get the ratepayers to subsidize their continued operation of these uneconomic dinosaur coal plants. They get us to shore up allow them to still still show a profit by paying higher rates that are justified because they're basically letting them run these dirty old plants. They're very inefficient and really can't compete with renewables. So that and that's something we can all do at the state level comes up time for uh, doing the rates for a, for a coal plant, whether it's here in Maryland or Virginia or anywhere else. Go there and say, why are we paying for this plant? 
you know, sometimes they want us to pay to extend the life of the thing, you know, kind of like you know, you've got an old junky car and you've got a car that's 30 or 40 years old and it needs a new engine. You know, you're not going to pay thousands of dollars for a new engine, but that's what we're doing with these clunky old plants. And so what do you like? Um, and just so we, we are about to dismiss for lunch, but I just want to end with one question, which is, so Earth Justice and Union of Concerned Scientists are both nonprofit organizations. Um, and so we, and there's a lot of resource staff nonprofit organizations working on these issues. How are we collectively having this conversation? We already talked, you know, this it comes up naturally, just the what lack of capital we have to fight so many, so many battles. How are we having this conversation with funders as a nonprofit community so that A, we can you know, achieve our missions and B, we can make the whole movement itself more equitable? Because um, I know a lot of the, the issues with funding are, you know, in, in the EJ space is that it's still a lot of like the big white environmental groups getting a lot of the funding and sucking up a lot of the funding in the space. So how are we as, you know, here today together having this conversation with funders to make the work itself more equitable and our goals achieved? Easy one. Yeah, yeah. Let's just talk a lot for a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a big problem. Uh, we're thinking about it a lot and trying to see what our role is in that. So, there's currently a working group my boss is a part of to think about how do we get that funding stream connections with the big, the big foundation funders yeah. and connect them to communities. Yeah. Uh, so, they're making sort of a big picture on that and how that happens, and then. We, in our own grants, write in and, and work with communities to uh, do the grant writing and have it have and make it so part of the funding uh, goes to them directly. Um, we also uh, we do a lot of funding directly of community work. So if we, you know, in in Houston or Delaware, and we we were working with them, we're, we we recognize their need for capacity to do that work and work with us, and uh, and so. Um, we do that as well so that we can be effective and they can be effective and we can lift up their voices more so. And so, uh, so I think there's a couple pieces of that. Another area that we work in is um, getting the scientific community to also be more inclusive. So uh, we do a lot of uh, bringing community members to scientific conferences and letting them talk about these issues and uh, and I, I think that has been very effective to just open up the scientific communities uh, arena to, to people and, and to, to getting new other perspectives and the understanding that knowledge isn't only uh, scientific and it's not only common sense. But if you have other ideas. We have, it's uh, called, we provide free legal services to many groups in many parts of the country. That wasn't really your question, though. Your question is about getting funding. We've been working with a number of foundations to get uh, funding for the client groups we work with. And I there's a consortium of foundations, a lot of projects that are working on this issue. But uh, we've been proactive in trying to get our foundations that are funding us and also fund the community groups that are affected. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here today.